All right. Wow. Wow. Y'all are too kind. Too kind. Appreciate it. Y'all are amazing. Love you guys so much. It is so great to be back with you. And if you're brand new among us in the last like five weeks, you have no idea who I am. I'm Micah. I'm the lead pastor here. And we have been away on sabbatical, me and my family. It's part of our regular rhythm. And it is so good to be back. We love you. We've missed you. We hope that y'all have had an amazing month. I've heard awesome reports of what's happened here on the weekends and our summer camp and other things God's been doing among us. And it is just, it's so good to be back in the house of worshiping with you and back among you. Before I get into my message, I want to begin with just recognizing the reality of what happened in the Omaha area this week. We had the hurricane level winds come through on Wednesday night, and I am sure that there are several of you um, in all of our campuses here in the Omaha area who are probably have some needs right now and are going through some stuff right now, and we want to take a minute to recognize you and then to pray for you. And so if you've lost power, if you've got a tree down that you can't get off your house, if you've got some needs that you're not sure how you're going to meet right now, if you're just emotionally like, I've had enough, um, will you just raise your hand real quick? We want to see who you are, and don't be shy to do that. Just neediness is beautiful in the eyes of the Lord, and, and just raise your hand. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, we're going to pray for those whose hands are up real quick. Will you all join me in that? God, we love you so much, and we thank you that you're always present. We thank you that you're always near, and we thank you that even, Lord, in the midst of the storm, your word makes it clear that you're available, that you're at peace, and that your resources are endless. And I want to pray for those who lifted their hands this morning, God, that, that you would meet them right now first in the spirit, that you would encourage them, that you would strengthen them, that you would give them hope, that you would give them creativity, that you would give them solutions. And I want to pray also, God, in the material way, God, that you would meet them with meeting all of their needs and pouring out the resources of heaven that you control and that you oversee into their lives. Surprise them with your generosity and your abundance. And Lord, also for the church to rise up, that we would see the hands of those lifted among us, that we would reach out to them, that we would see how we could help, and that we would put your love and your kindness on display in a real way. God, we look to you, we love you, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, it's been quite a week. Um, you know, when we were remodeling this part of West Dodge, we were also doing the basement, the sanctuary, the basement. And um, they said, you have to have hurricane level storm shelters. And we thought we are in Omaha, Nebraska. You're just trying to make more money off of us. And then Wednesday night, when Bill Ranby, the weatherman said, this is hurricane level winds, I realized those inspectors might be onto something. So um, we are definitely with you in all of this. We know many of you are struggling. I wanna encourage those of you who didn't raise your hand, if someone next to you did, maybe just ask them before you leave service today, um, do you need anything and how can I help? I think let's just be the body right now in the midst of it all. So a couple quick things. First of all, I am on a handheld mic for your good this morning. I've been battling a cough all month long and I thought it would be done by today. I went to the doctor this week and got a steroid shot and it is still there. And um, it, 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 let me just say it sounds worse than it is. So if I get into like a little coughing fit on stage, um, I'll be able to pull my mic away and you don't have to hear it. And, and your heart may go out to me because it looks like I'm choking and dying. Um, it's not nearly as bad as it looks, but every time I do it, Shireen is like, my wife's like, oh my gosh. But it's, it's not demonic um, and it's not nearly as uncomfortable as it looks, um, but this hopefully will help us out, and hopefully it just won't happen at all, but just in case, I'm doing this handheld. So just if you are newer among us, a couple things I want to say about sabbatical as I step back in, and the first is this, that it is good for all of us as a church when I go away on sabbatical. This has actually been the, the rhythm of Pastor Les for 27 years when he was our lead pastor. I believe our founding pastor, Elmer Murdoch, did this as well. Um, it's an opportunity for the lead pastor to pull away, and it, it, it really produces a lot of benefits. One, one of those is you get to hear from other people. You get to hear from other people on our team to hear this month some really vulnerable and powerful and transformative stories, and then you get to respond to that. 
And I believe that for us as a church, for y'all to be able to receive for more than just one person actually deepens our understanding of who God is and how he operates. So we had our campus teams preach and Pastor Sarah and Pastor Les and Pastor Connie and Pastor Robert and Pastor Mike. Can we give them a hand for serving you this month? I love it. I have not... I have not listened to all of the messages. Um, I have listened to some of them, and um, I, I know they were amazing, and I just can't wait to, to, to get into the rest of them. The second thing is um, when I go away on sabbatical, it's a reminder to me that Jesus is more committed to LifeGate than I am, that, that I am not the center of things. No one person is the center of things. He made a promise to us that we see in the Gospels, I will build my church. And he is going to be faithful to do that no matter who is present in the moment because he's just that committed. And that for me as a lead pastor is a great reminder that this whole thing doesn't rest on my shoulders. It rests on his and it exists in his heart. And, and that for me is healthy. The, the last reason why we do this pulling away is it's an opportunity to pray, to lean into vision, to really just hear what God's saying for the house and I'm just going to be honest with you. This is not like super spirituality here. It did not happen that well this month, at least not in the way that I designed it to. There were a lot of unexpected things that came our way. We, at the very beginning of sabbatical, had this big like 60-foot tree fall on our house and just kind of create all kinds of damage that we were dealing with. And then a few days after that, our youngest got, came down with appendicitis. And so we spent July 4th and 5th in the hospital and she's doing great and the surgery went great, but it definitely was an inconvenience. And then on about two weeks after that, our kids were telling me that their tub was, was clogged. And so I decided I'm gonna be a great plumber I'm not going to call anybody. I'm going to take care of this myself. Okay. And so I drain it one night, didn't work. Drain it again the next night, didn't work. I've done this several times with this particular tub. And then I realized I just got to get my little auger thing out and kind of go snake it out a little bit. And so I did a little auger thing. I kind of snaked it out. Everything opened up. I had the hot water running. I'm patting myself on the back. What a great job I did as a plumber. And everyone in the house begins to scream turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. And I turned it off and I just like braced myself. After the month we had already had, I was like, what is it? Oh my gosh, what is it? Now our house has turned a hundred years old this year. She is showing her age. So I went down into the kitchen and water is pouring from our kitchen ceiling through our fixtures into our microwave. Our oven. I mean, just water's everywhere. It's down in the basement. So what ha we have these old lead pipes and um, I did not clear the clog. I poked a hole in the pipe is what happened. So we got that done and it's fine. We're going to be okay. But here's the reality. Sabbatical didn't go quite as we expected it to. I was thinking of a quote from my good friend, Annie F. Downs, who says, if I were God, I wouldn't God the way God gods. And I thought of that so many times this month. Lord, if I were you, I would have reserved all these things. I would have spread them out and... I would not have put him in July because I'm just trying to rest, right? And, and yet he saw fit to do something different. And yet he's good in the midst of it. And one of the things that we realized when we finally did get some peace and quiet at the end of the month, Shereen and I went to Scottsdale while the kids were at summer camp and we had some quiet and some rest in the 107 degree sun, which I love, honestly. It was wonderful. Um, it, was, it was this, the dots begin to connect for us. And, and the dot, one of them was our rest in life, our peace in life, our strength in life does not come from our circumstances. It comes from connection to Jesus. And in a year where he's inviting us to be a more wholehearted people, that's our vision for the year, he used this sabbatical, not in the way I would design, but in the way he saw fit to get more of our hearts. And both Shereen and I would say at the end of the month, it wasn't always pretty. I'm not trying to over-spiritualize this. I mean, there were some shaking of our fists every now and then, but where we landed at the end of the month is like, Lord, you are so good and you are so wise and we are so yours. And I wanna tell you, when you get to that place in life, regardless of what you're up against, it is the place of peace and the place of strength that your heart longs for. And so coming out of sabbatical, I'm just reminded of this invitation 
this vision that God has given us this year that we are called to become a more wholehearted people. Now, this comes from David commissioning his son Solomon as the next king of Israel. And he says in 1 Chronicles 28, 9, and you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. At the beginning of Solomon's reign, before David gave him the plans for the temple, which was Solomon's assignment to build the temple, David addressed the matters and the motives of the heart because everything flows from the heart. He wanted to get the heart peace right. And for us as a church, as I'm stepping in as your lead pastor, as I believe God is like spooling up to give us some fresh vision and some new assignments on the horizon, before he gives us those things, I believe in 2024, God has said, but I want to address the matters of the heart. Y'all, this is not about salvation. This is not about forgiveness of sins, putting our faith in Jesus, repenting of our sin, turning from him. You get salvation immediately, y'all. We get, we get salvation from hell and from our punishment that we deserve. And we get the grace and the mercy of God poured into our life as soon as we turn from ourselves and we turn to Jesus. What I'm talking about is not just that, it's beyond that, it's maturity. It's not just salvation. What we're talking about this year is maturity. Wholeheartedness is about maturity. It's about actually accessing everything that Jesus did for us on the cross. The forgiveness of sins, huge deal, but that's just the doorway we walk through in order to enter into unbroken relationship with God through which everything else flows. And too many Christians walk through that doorway and they stay there for the rest of their earthly lives. And they miss out on the full abundant life that Jesus came to offer them. But I believe God says for the wholehearted, you can have it all. And that's what we're going after this year is to become more wholehearted. Now, I want you to know this, that this word is not just a one year theme for us as a church. It really encapsulates who we have always been and what we will always be about. Many of you might be familiar with our life code. Our life code are eight big ideas that we want to lean into as a people. You could call them our spiritual DNA as a family. Our life codes are listed at all of our campuses. They're online. You can see them either on the walls or online. You can check them out. And what I wanna help us see throughout this month in this series called DNA, is that this vision for wholehearted is not just for 2024 and then it will expire and we will try something else, but this is actually a word that encapsulates our entire life code. It's a idea that encapsulates the the wholeness of our DNA that we are called to lean into and to become more like. Now, our very first life code is we thirst first for God. Our primary pursuit in life as a staff and as a church is relationship with Jesus. We keep this as our first priority and the one from which all of our other priorities flow. This, y'all can see, is very much connected to wholehearted. They really all are, but this is the clearest one that I wanna highlight today. That we are a people and have been a people and always will be a people who say our goal in life is to thirst first for God. That's what it means to be wholehearted is to thirst first for God. What I wanna do today is describe a little bit more of what it truly means to thirst first for God, what it truly means to be wholehearted, and then some steps you can take to move in that direction and to get really practical. So let's go back to the beginning, okay? So this idea of wholehearted, we really find it in the life of David and the kings of Israel. And I've been reading through the kings this summer, so it's just even more kind of coming alive in me as I read through this. Beginning with David, we see him described as a man after God's own heart. A couple places in scripture, scripture in the Old and the New Testament that refer to that. David was described as a man after God's own heart. Now, we know by looking at David, he was not perfect. He didn't always get it right. Think about Bathsheba, adultery, and Uriah, murder. Like David didn't always get it right, and yet he was defined as a man after God's own heart. And then when he commissions his son Solomon 
to take the throne and take leadership of Israel, as I mentioned earlier, he addresses the motives in the matters of the heart. He might've known that this son Solomon, he looks like a go-getter and he's a type three on the Enneagram. He's, a, he's, he's, he's this type A, like go after it, success, achieve, what it looks like on the outside is what matters most kind of a guy. David could probably see this. And so before he handed him the plans to accomplish the assignment, David dressed the matters and the motives of the heart. And then he reminded them, remember, it says in 1 Chronicles 28, for God searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. We know that Solomon got this at first. In fact, after he built the temple and then he was dedicating the temple to God and he was then encouraging the people to worship and to seek God first and foremost, he actually echoes the heart of his father, David, when he says in 1 Kings 8, 61, that the nation is to be wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord. This was his declaration as he stood in the temple. And yet, as we follow the life of Solomon, what we discover, he gave his heart to other loves. He gave his worship to other gods. And at the end of his time as the king, it says in 1 Kings 11, he was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord. So even right off the get-go, like this whole idea of wholeheartedness, it's like, okay, is it always or is it sometimes? Is it behavior or is it motive? I mean, it's already getting a little muddy if you're following me. And then as we look through some of the other kings, most of them were evaluated by what they did. It will say, as you read through First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, when it describes a king, it'll often say he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, or he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And that has to do with, that has to do with behavior and decisions. But for some of the kings, it addresses the matters of the heart beyond the behavior. For, the, for Solomon's grandson, his name's Abijam. It says he walked in the sins of his father and was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord. That's 1 Kings 15. For Asa, one of the good kings, this was Abijam's son. It says he was wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his entire life. And yet he did some things wrong if you read his story. And there was a time where he did not trust in the Lord and the Lord rebuked him for that. Amaziah, the ninth king of Judah, it says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. And he wound up becoming a murderer and an idolater. And then we have Hezekiah, who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, experienced some suffering, and then declared to the Lord, I will follow you wholeheartedly, and I've always followed you wholeheartedly. And the Lord responded to the prayer of the heart. And so right off the bat here, what I'm trying to bring to the surface is this stuff is kind of hard to measure. When it comes to the motives and the matters of the heart, it's a little difficult to determine if we're wholehearted or not. We're not good at this. We don't understand how to accurately assess other people's motives. People we like, we give them a lot of grace for their motives. People we don't like, we don't give them a lot of grace, right? We don't, even, we don't know how to assess the motives of our kids. We don't know how to assess the motives of our spouse and, and, and our family members. How much less do we know how to address the motives and assess the motives of our neighbors and our coworkers and our politicians? Like, let's not even start there. And then ourselves. Like, this is hard stuff. And so in a year where God's saying, I want you to be more wholeheartedly devoted to me, if you think about this, with some real thought, you might come to a conclusion, I don't know if I am. Is it behavior? Is it intention? Like, what exactly is it? Jesus, what are you going for? How can we move towards a wholehearted life and a wholehearted devotion to you? Well, one of the places I think we can often find clarity is in the teaching of Jesus. I'm a big fan of anything I teach. I try to go back, even if it's Old Testament, no matter where it is, I wanna go to the teaching of Jesus and find out what did he have to say about this particular topic? What did he have to say about this idea? You could say it this way, Jesus is our hermeneutic as a church. Like we interpret everything theologically, everything in this book through the lens of Jesus, through his word and his ways. And so if you look at the life of Jesus, what you'll discover, he doesn't use the word wholehearted specifically 
at all. In fact, in the whole New Testament, we only find it one time, and it's talking about how slaves are to work for their masters, which is a different talk we will d address at a different time, potentially. But what Jesus really says, I think, addresses wholeheartedness just in a different way. Here's one of the ways he addresses it. Matthew 22, you've heard this before. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. These weren't original words to Jesus. These are found in Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five, and they are a summary of all God said to the people of Israel when the, he was inviting them into relationship with him, that everything between me and you, between us has to be rooted in love has to be rooted in love. And it's a love relationship that God came to invite us into. And Jesus echoes that here in Matthew 22. In John chapter 14, he says this, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. And so we know that it's not just about obedience, doing all the right things. It's where does that obedience come from? It comes from a place of love. If we love God, we will eventually obey him. It might not happen overnight. Your life might not change in a moment, but if you love God, you will eventually find yourself more and more obedient to the teaching, the words and the ways of Jesus. And then lastly, Jesus says this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And here he's talking about our inv the invitation that he offers us to die to ourselves, to lay ourselves down and to trust him above ourselves. As a church, we'll, we will say this loud and clear. We don't just see Jesus as savior who has forgiven us of our sins, but also as Lord who gets to run our lives and actually runs our lives better than we do. So Jesus addressed wholehearted devotion in his teaching what he invited us into, just he didn't use the word wholehearted in the way that it was used in the Old Testament. And here's how I think we can sum up everything Jesus had to say about wholeheartedness. I think we can sum it up in this one simple word, surrender. That's ultimately what Jesus was getting at. Life in Jesus is not about agreement. It's not about saying, yeah, I, I just agree that you were the son of God and you died and rose again. It's about surrender. It's about actually believing that because Jesus died and rose again, he's God, I'm not, and his way is better than my way. And when we can surrender, we can enter into everything that God has for us. To be a people who thirst first for God, to be a people who are wholeheartedly devoted to God is an issue of surrender. And really what that means is it's a matter of the will. It's a matter of the will. Now we have this thing, okay? We have this thing inside of us as human beings that dogs don't have and trees don't have and mountains don't have and flies don't have. Like we have this thing inside of us that no other created thing has and it's called the will. It's called the will. We actually have a level of determination in our lives that God has given us. We see this in children from a very early age. We were taught, we went to a little parenting class when we had our first child, six weeks old, we went to a parenting class and we realized we are way too early. We need to wait a little bit to have to parent our child, but hopefully we remember this stuff. But one of the things we remembered is as soon as your child can crawl, they can obey. Y'all, that was such good wisdom because some of y'all misassess the motives of your kid's heart. And they disobey you and you're like, they don't know any better. They're just a kid, they don't know any better. As soon as they can crawl, they can obey. And we found that to be true. Once they have mobility, they have the will, this ability to go where you're asking them to go and to make a choice about it, right? And so we have this thing inside of us and it grows and it grows and it grows as we go about our lives. Now we live in a world right now that tries to get us off the hook. And it tries to say, actually, you don't have any power in life. Like who you are is a product of the culture in which you live, the society that has shaped and formed you, or your own internal makeup that you had no power over. And what those things have done, as we have talked about those things, there's a level of truth in all of that, but what those things have done is it's caused us to live passive victim mentality lives. 
that say things like, well, I can't help it. I was born this way. It's just what I want. It's how I feel. It was how I was made. It's what they forced upon me. And we make ourselves a victim to the world in which we live or our personal makeup when scripture and science, but we won't get into the science behind it, but scripture reveals to us, no, you have a will. You get to make decisions. You have a level of determination and agency over your life that can influence the trajectory, not only of what you do, but of who you become and what we understand of your eternal state. The will is the power to shift our entire destiny. And we are not victims and we are not powerless and we are not helpless in every way. We have a will. Now, what we don't have always is the ability to stop doing a habitual sin that we've tried to stop doing forever. What we sometimes don't have is the ability to believe God for miracles when we've seen so much disappointment in our lives. What we sometimes don't have is the ability to just be joyful when life feels hard. But what we do have in every one of those situations is this tiny thing deep inside called the will where we can offer this yes to God. And all he's asking for is that little yes in order to grab a hold of our hearts and move us in his direction, to free us from the sin in our lives, to give us joy when, when, we're, in, when we're in the midst of difficulty, or even to give us belief and faith and hope when we have experienced disappointment. We can't muster all that stuff up, but God can release it in us through an act of our will. Here, here's one way to think about it, okay? So one of the things that came out of sabbatical for me is I got a little bit better at golf. Okay, it was one of my goals of like, I just want to play golf once a week, where regardless of whether there's a tree on the house or water in the kitchen, I want to just play golf once a week. And I actually got better throughout the month. And, and it actually reminded me when I first started playing golf in my early 20s, and I was terrible, just a little bit worse than I am now. I have not improved much, but, but I was hanging out with a golf pro that I knew who worked at a clubhouse, and we were playing golf together. And, and I asked him, what's one thing I can do to my swing to get better? And his encouragement to me that I think applies to so many areas of life is at this point in your game, you just need to spend more time on the course. Like, it's like, I can't even, like, basically you're saying this, your swing's so messed up, like, I don't even know where to begin. But just like, get out there, just get out there and, and you'll get better. Like at that point, that's all I needed. And for us to live surrendered lives that are wholeheartedly devoted to Jesus might feel like, oh, I've gotta be willing to go to Africa and die for you. I've gotta be willing to give all my money away to the church or to this need. I've gotta be willing to stand up in the workplace and risk my job and preach the gospel during lunch hour, right? Like some of us think that's what it means to be wholehearted, but really to be fully surrendered to be fully submitted. It's this act of the will where we can just show up. I can't overnight make my swing a whole lot better, but I can make a tea time and I can go play. And what every one of us can do when it comes to relationship with Jesus is we can make little decisions of our will that allow us to surrender and to submit what he has for us. And here's the beauty of it all, y'all. Jesus isn't asking us anything that he didn't already do as an example. When we use the word surrender in our world today or submission in our world today, man, it's a scary word. It's not a sexy word. It doesn't feel like a safe word. People are abused. People are mistreated. People are manipulated. The thing that Jesus offers us that makes surrender to him so safe is that he did it first. He surrendered first to everything that God had for him. And trust me, it was way harder than anything God might have for us. This isn't gonna be on the screen, but in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus's darkest hour, just before he goes on the cross, it says that he's with his disciples. This is Matthew 26. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, 
And he said to them, sit here while I go over, over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that was James and John, along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he says to them, he expresses this emotion, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here with me. And going on a little far, far, further, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. There was a battle of the wills happening right there in the garden. And then Jesus goes on and finds his disciples, encourages them to keep praying. And then in verse 42, he went away a second time and he prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And Jesus was saying in this moment, is there any other way to save the world, to forgive sin, to, to draw sons and daughters into the heart of the father than me having to hang on a cross. And I want y'all to hear this real loud and clear, y'all. Jesus's greatest temptation in life was not the lies of the enemy in the desert. It was submitting to the will of the father in the garden. Y'all, the enemy's gonna come after us and it'll be challenging and it'll be difficult and we'll get through it because God's faithful. But it's the stuff that God allows into our life that often tests the metal of our hearts. There was a man named Francois Fenelon back in like the 1600s. He was a theologian and a bishop. And he said this, and this was in my wife's devotional during sabbatical that just caught our attention. He said, God never makes you suffer unnecessarily. He intends for you to suffer. He intends for your suffering to heal and purify you. The hand of God hurts you as little as it can. The hand of God hurts you as little as it, as it can. Y'all, we don't necessarily say that what we experienced in sabbatical was hardcore suffering, but it hurt a little bit. It was disappointing. It, it was distracting. It wasn't quite what we had in mind. And I know this, people in this, these rooms right now, y'all are going through stuff much worse and you're feeling some difficulty. You're feeling some disappointment. You're feeling some pain and suffering is rising. And you're tempted to push away from God. But the example of Jesus says, in those moments, lean in. As an act of your will, say, yes, I'll endure. Yes, I'll stay faithful. Yes, I'll keep leaning in. Yes, I'll look to you even more clearly. Y'all, the real beauty of what Jesus wants to do in our lives begins with our will. It begins with this tiny little thing inside of us that's either gonna say yes or it's gonna say no. It's gonna welcome what, what God wants to do or it's gonna push away what God wants to do. And there's actually some very practical ways to do this. And I wanna give you those right now, okay? Some practical ways to keep your will moving towards the will of the Father. The first is just take on a new posture. Be willing to take on a new posture in life. So often the direction and the desire of our will is related to just our overall posture in life. And in the way that you can take on a different posture, you live countercultural to the world, meaning this, you repent when you make a mistake. You forgive when someone makes a mistake against you. Like you, you humble yourself when you wanna fight. You, you serve when you wanna be selfish. Like if you can take that kind of posture, this like soft hearted posture that Jesus modeled to us, he never had to repent, but we see all of these other things. We, we see that he forgives and we see that he was humble and we see that he was a servant. If we can take that on, that will keep the will inside of us moved and, and directed in the right direction because it's anti-human to do all of those things. When we mess up, it's not human to repent, it's human to hide or to defend. It's supernatural to say, I was wrong, please forgive me. When someone hurts us, it's human to say, they gotta pay for it. But it's supernatural to say, I'll forgive you. When we wanna be selfish, it's human to say, let me do me, right? But it's supernatural to say, how can I serve you? If we change the posture of our heart, it actually keeps our will moving in the right direction. And then second thing, take on a new practice. We talk about practices a lot in the church. We talk about, um, you know, scripture, pr 
prayer. Sabbath is a big one for us. We believe that, it, man, if you take a day off once a week just to say, God, you're God, I'm not. I'm gonna trust you and I'm gonna lean into you. It's a beautiful way to live life. Right, if you do some of the basics of following Jesus, these are called spiritual practices, it actually keeps your will soft before God. Now, some of you need to start. Like, you might be like, man, I need to just start reading the Bible once a day. And it might need to start just with a prayer time once a day. Others of you might need to change what you're doing because it's no longer stirring surrender in your heart. So there was a week of our sabbatical where we were in Wisconsin. We were at a little lake house kind of a place and it was just kind of a house in the woods near a lake. And I have been in this real pattern over the last many years where I get up and I read my Bible almost every day, and I love it. Like, it doesn't feel like a discipline. Like, I can't wait to get up and to open my Bible and to get some coffee going and just, like, sit with Jesus with my Bible open. And I felt like at the beginning of this week, this thought ran through my head, don't read your Bible this week. And, and it wasn't like this, get behind me, Satan. How could you tell me not to read my Bible? Like, honestly, it was like this, maybe I need that. Maybe, maybe I need to kind of get out of my pattern and how I do things. And so I picked up a new little practice just for those seven days, and I've actually continued it ever since, where I, I decided I'm not going to read my Bible. I'm just going to wake up in the morning, and I'm going to go for a walk. And not only am I going to go for a walk, I'm going to take some coffee with me, in, a, in, a, in a, a cup that can spill, like a mug, okay? And you know what that made me do? Slow down. It made me walk slow enough where I didn't slosh. And what I did was I walked until I was done with my coffee, and then I went home. And I'll be honest with y'all. Like, nothing crazy happened. Like, I didn't see any angels. Jesus didn't walk alongside of me in the flesh. I didn't have any deep revelation. I didn't have any deep revelation on anything that I could really share with y'all. But here's what I realized at the end of the week, that even in my Bible reading, I had begun to take control. And God wanted me to just do something that would cause me to surrender. Is there anything in life right now that you could take on that would be an act of surrender? Prayer. Scripture, worship, Sabbath. Y'all, Sabbath, huge. For many of y'all, if you decide to Sabbath, it will be an act of surrender because you'll think, how will I get everything done? And that's part of the beauty of Sabbath because you won't and life will be okay and you're not nearly as in control as you think you are or as important as you think you might be. Like these are all practices that God invites us into and all of the practices are intended to keep us surrendered because that's what it's all about. I heard a pastor recently, John Mark Comer, say, you can sum up the entire discipleship process in the simple word, surrender. And if we are surrendered, we will become wholehearted. I believe it with everything in me. Lastly, a new posture first, a new practice, and lastly, a new perspective. Some of us just need to be reminded that God's big, that God's good, that God's loving, that he's kind, that he's faithful. You just need a new perspective. When we read about Jesus in the garden, that was one of Jesus's darkest moments. And yet Hebrews tells us, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus, when he was able to regain the perspective of God, was able to endure the cross. And when we have the perspective of God, we can endure whatever it is life throws at us. Whether it comes from the pit of hell or whether it comes from the loving hand of the Father. If it's hard, our temptation is always to do it our way. And what God invites us into is to trust him with his way. And Jesus went first. A lot of us, y'all, we might be going through some hard things. None of us are going through anything like the cross, if we're honest. I mean, that's about the highest level suffering that it could get. That God himself gives up the power and the authority that he had seated at the right hand of the Father, and he comes down in the form of a flesh, and he's named Jesus, and he walks among us, 
and he teaches us and he embodies what the heart of the Father looks like so that it could be recorded and written down and read for generations. And then by the very people he loves, that he created, that he made, and that he called to himself, he gets mocked, he gets spit on, he gets a crown of thorns, he gets pummeled and whipped and then put up on a cross. Y'all, that's real suffering. And Jesus was willing to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. There's this passage related to wholeheartedness found in 2 Chronicles that I think is the Lord's invitation to us this year as we become a people who thirst more for him and or become more wholehearted. It says this, for the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself strong. Or in some translations, it says to strengthen those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. Y'all, what we discover when we surrender is that our strength is actually found in our surrender. That our peace is actually found in our surrender that our wisdom is found in our surrender, that our resources are found in our surrender, that when we feel like we don't have what it takes, instead of trying to do our will, when we trust God's will, we find a strength, a supernatural strength that flows down to us from heaven. And that to me is what he desires for a wholehearted people. And so I'm gonna ask at every campus right now, in every room of the house, if you'll close your eyes and and just open yourself up before the Lord. You can like get into a posture where you sit up a little bit more straight or you open your hands up or you even like lift your head to heaven. If you wanna receive, if you wanna surrender, just posture yourself right now. Lord, we say, God, we need you. We don't have what it takes. But oftentimes things aren't going the way we want things to go. Oftentimes things aren't rolling the direction that we hoped they would roll. And at times, Lord, we're tempted to shake our fist at you. And at times we're tempted to, to walk away from you. In this moment, Jesus, we declare together we're yours. And if you can say that and like mean it, I just encourage you to say it to him right now. We're yours. Even say it out loud. I'm yours. I'm yours. And Holy Spirit, we give you freedom right now to search our hearts for anything that isn't yours. And we want to give it to you anything you might highlight in our lives, our time, our money, our reputation, our way of thinking, our politics, our opinions, our offenses, our disappointments, our conditions, yours. God, you can have it. We surrender. And we know, God, that your way is better than our way, that your way is good, that your way is beautiful, that your way is excellent, that your way is the way of strength, your way is the way of hope, your way is the way of peace, your way is the way of joy, your way is the way of delight. Your way is the way that our hearts actually long for. God, and though our our hearts long and look for things and we go about, go in our own way to go about these things and get these things, Lord, we know they're dead ends when they're not yours. And we say together, God, we wanna walk in your way and we wanna be in your will. Lord, we love you, we receive you, and we ask this in your name, amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand? this